you have one of this. Blast Radio 94.3 New Jersey. Well, I don't know, Mr. G represent for 94.3 FM Splash Radio. We will splash out the music on them. Him, your 
our attention, please. This is no ordinary show. Covering news and information for Essex County, New Jersey, and beyond. This is the Eric Dawson Radio Show. Broadcasting from 94.3 Splash Radio. Now, here's your host, giving it to you like only he can. It's Eric Dawson. Hey, this is Eric Dawson, and uh, this is the Eric Dawson Radio Show, 94.3 FM. Call at number 973-457-8000. Again, 973-457-8000. If you're listening through your mobile devices, 213-493-0287. And um, you can always check us out live. We're streaming on Facebook. Man, today is Monday, Kev. <laughs> we are bouncing around, man. Plugs are getting plugged in. But you know what? Right. Uh, there was somebody on um, who inboxed me once. They said they enjoy watching you know, the setup for the show. You know, right. usually when you do, you know, people are doing their uh, their radio shows, you only get to hear it. Uh, right. But when we stream live, uh, mm. we get to invite them in, you know, and things are, are, are normal. You know what I mean? We're getting ready. We're getting set up. Uh, and, uh, you know, and hopefully we'll we'll present a good pro- uh, broadcast for them. You always do. Yeah, hey, try, man. You always do. How was your weekend? I was fine. I slept. I did, uh, I did absolutely nothing. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I try to do nothing on the weekends. I try to read Saturday on the weekends. Sa- I, listen, I went to a friend's brunch under protest, but he's one of my dearest friends, so I went to his brunch. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, all week long I'm running around, you know, talking, working with my partners, trying to look at new business strategies, trying to do everything. So Saturday and Sunday comes. I, I don't really want to do much. Right. You know, I just want to just bring it down and, and keep it quiet. And um, I, I basically did it. The rain helped me. It was raining. I mean, oh, man, wasn't it? Really? Saturday was bad, man. Man, I was sleeping, man. I was feeling great, man. When I sleep, that's like a mirror. I was down at AC on Saturday, man, and I, um, it was, uh, you know, I was out of my element. Oh, it, yeah? I'm, big, I'm not an AC guy. You know, just too much. It was sensory overload for me. Right. You know, I'm used to being in quiet environments, man, where things are really organized. You get down there, man, between the... The uh, the sounds of all of the the roulette tables, the mm-hmm. you know whatever the other devices are that they you know they play on, all those things were going off. The bells are whistling, people are screaming <laughs> and hollering, drinks are going all over and smoking. And I, I, I said to Terry, I said I just want to go back up to the room. Um, I did get a little chance to. So rest. you stayed down there uh, one day, good, man. Good, good, one good, day, good. and then and then back. Well, but you know you got to get away. That's what Listen, we're said. going on a long vacation this year. I mean, we're going, Where you guys go? we're going to Greece. Oh, really? And then we're going to go to Venice. And then we're going to go down to the shore a little bit and stay. Mm-hmm. But this summer, I'm getting, I'm going away. Yeah. You know, Terry, we're 24, my household is 24 hours a day. Well, that's about where we are. You know? And Terry says we got to get away, so maybe we'll make that happen. Mm-hmm. Listen, we've got um, a couple guests coming in today. Uh, we have, uh, from Irvington, we have Donald Malloy who's mm-hmm. the Director of Recreation, and mm-hmm. we have Tracy uh, Bowers, who is the uh, Director of Public Safety. So we're going to have a conversation uh, with the two of them. We're also going to have a caller. Uh, From Anthony Smith, tell us what you do. Tell us what you do. Executive Director of um, Lincoln Park Coast Coastal. We're hey, going to try to bring people in every week so they can tell us what they do. You know, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of great stuff. And we need to talk you about know, it. We need to talk about it. Yeah. You know, so that's great. He's supposed to call in at 1030, so, you know. All right. Otherwise, Nat, though, you, um, did you gamble when you were in Atlantic I City? I did not. Oh, man. Yeah, I can't Well, listen, that. every time I go to Atlantic City with friends, they tell me to stay away from the casino because I'm bad luck for them. <laughs> 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 They're like, Kevin, get away from me because you don't gamble. Do you go down often? No, I go down twice a year. Mm-hmm. But I, th- I think it's on the rebound. You know, I was I was trying to look at it because you know I I read the headlines about yeah. Atlantic City all of this city itself is not on the rebound but oh, I man. think the casinos are are on, they, they had a great year last year yeah but you you know you go a couple blocks and make a turn man and yeah. it's a whole different world it's the story of America right it is the story it story is the of story America. of America man I mean, and you know um, by the way you you sent a couple articles yeah. But I'm hoping that we get an opportunity oh, yeah. to uh, to talk about them. Uh, one that I found to be really fascinating was the the jobs article that you sent. Right. 
uh, in in terms of you know how we need to re look at um, you know jobs in America or for America, right? And um, the article suggests that we should take a lesson from Germany and yeah. how Germany is uh, you know has been handling um, uh, what, what would we call it development, job development. Well, yeah, what they what they've done is vocational education is at the same level as your traditional education. So you know you get your liberal arts education, but vocational education is key. And they have done such a phenomenal job. I mean, their unemployment rate is, like, really low right. because of that. So uh, I, that's something I want us to spend. I would like to do like we did for Education Week. Mm -hmm. I would like to do a whole week focused on, you know, innovative uh, programs or innovative processes for creating jobs. I think that every jobs program that I've paid attention to in the state of New Jersey is in the 18th century, never mind the 19th century. And I think that we have to change the debate on that or create a new dialogue about it and it's really serious and if you can post it I don't you know post it for people to read before we start to talk about it and then there was another one on public education mm -hmm. that I thought was great so you know the show to this show to me is so important because it informs people and our job is to give them the information empower them to be able to use that information so when they're dialoguing with their leaders and their their people in their churches or you know anything about jobs anything about health care anything about you know, innovation, they'll have it. They'll be able to read it and say, well, you know, I just read this this study that um, on Eric Dawson's show they introduced me to, and the heading is Jobs for Americans, a lesson from Germany. And um, I think it's as it is an important issue because we're going to be dealing with this unemployment issue at a whole nother level as the marketplaces change. So job training and apprenticeship and, and, and how we do that we know we have to take that serious. You know, we always talk about we got an apprentice program, but nobody gets a job. Right. You know, we, we say we have an apprentice program, but nobody's being trained in the, um, the, in the workforce, the, work the emerging workforce, right? So we keep saying it over and over again, and we keep selling it, but basically it's a lie because we're, we're not tooled. We're not tooled the right way to get it done. And it's, so it's not gonna, just a matter, and what I got out of the article is not just a matter of of looking at government to solve it, right? Right. There has to be uh, public-private partnerships. These, uh, what do you call them? Um, these <coughs> organizations, these nonprofits that are in our communities, have to get up off the pot, man. Well, J.P. Morgan Chase is really big in in this in this discussion. They've been big for the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and they've been talking about vocational education as the tool to change America's workforce. And it says here. The good news, the unemployment rate has dropped below 5%, but this doesn't mean all is well with the U.S. labor market. More and more we hear of employers who are struggling to fill open positions, which raises the question, what steps, what steps should we be taking to build a talent pipeline that will expand opportunity and drive competitiveness? One answer comes from the example of Germany, a country where a combination of policy and practice helps to align the needs of employers with the skills of workers, right? And that has been an issue, an ongoing issue, especially in communities of color, <clears throat> because I, I believe the talent pool that we are, um, um, that are leading that discussion aren't the right ones. I agree. They're, not, they're not capable of understanding what I just read in that first paragraph, because they're, ki they're, still, they're still selling, you know, they're still selling the old model. And I want to have a, a week that we discuss what are the best practices to create, any, uh, create an effective workforce in and the And I future. think that one of the things that would be helpful is maybe we reach out to, to the different municipalities and see if we can get folks to come on who are responsible for uh, workforce <clears throat> development. Yeah, it says more than half of all unfulfilled positions in the U.S. are so-called middle-skilled jobs. Now, listen to this, middle-skilled jobs, meaning they require a high school diploma and some post-secondary education, but not a four-year college degree. Many of these middle skill jobs are both high tech and professional, um, professional positions, and more important, many of them pay well because of the lack of qualified candidates, though they take twice as long to fill, 40 days instead of 20 days. Now, you and I have talked about, you know, the emerging market. We talked about, you know, the jobs for the future. We talked about the new emerging industries. We've been talking about this for the last four to five months. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we've introduced a book called um, The Fourth Industry. I think it was The Fourth Industry. I think I've brought right. the book for you. We should put that back up um, next week. But we need to start that discussion because if we're eight years out now still having the same discussion we're having now, we're, we're just gonna, that's going to be it. 
and the marketplace is global now. So we're not just compete. I'm not competing against you, um, uh, Eric. I'm competing against the world. That's right. And you know, a lot of our kids are been going off to college. A lot of our kids are doing great stuff. But we need to start building a new workforce for the t for the 21st century. And that goes back to the education debate we've been having for the last couple of um, weeks. Wow. I got I got an idea. My one of one of our quiet producers that help us all the time came up with this um, this whole piece about Reggie Bledsoe because she was surprised. They were surprised that he hadn't apologized yet. So um, the, the producer said, well, when you know what you guys should do? You should put Reggie's face up and do a countdown on how many days it's going to take him to apologize to the public. I, I, and if he doesn't apologize to the public, that says a lot about how he feels about himself and he feels about his community, feels about his responsibility at the Board of Education. So she said that, I said, I don't have the capacity to do that. I said, but I'll talk to Eric. And Eric you know, can have somebody post that go from the election day to now mm -hmm. and keep going. How many days is it going to take him to apologize? I, I agree with that. Well, listen, we're going to take, well, and then we're going to talk about some other things. Yeah. Donald Trump. Oh, the gift that Trump, keeps on Trump, giving. Trump, Trump, <laughs> Trump. You got to love it. The you got to love this guy. You know, I was watching Morning Joe uh, this morning, man, and I mean, now they're calling him a thug. They're calling him all these <laughs> other things, and you know. That's how he's acting. Well, it is how he's acting, you know, uh, but but I, I got some questions for you uh, regarding that. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> oh, God, have mercy. You see, that's the look I that Ian <laughs> normally has, man. Ian's like, oh, here we go. But we'll get to all of that uh, as soon as we, um, we're going to take a break. We're going to bring these guests on because we, okay, we know good. that they're busy. Right, um, uh, we're going to start with uh, Director of Recreation, Donald Malloy. We're going to take a commercial break, get, get, him, get him set up here, and then um, and then we'll go. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Eric Dawson Radio Show on 94.3 FM. Looking for trustworthy professionals? Give Impact Corp a call. We will assist you with all your tax needs. We are a team of CPAs and IRS enrolled agents. If you are audited, our audit protection team will represent you at no out-of-pocket cost. We provide three years audit protection and a year identity theft protection so you can have peace of mind without fear of audit. Call our team of tax experts today, 973-395-4401. You're listening to the Eric Dawson Radio Show on 94.3 FM. Hey, this is Eric Dawson, and uh, and we're back. And we're back with uh, Mr. Malloy, who is the, um, the Director of Recreation in Irvington. Uh, we want to welcome him to the show. I'm going to have to share my mic with you, so we're going to do it like that. How uh, are that's you? A, that's a good share. That's a good share, Eric. I'm good, man. <laughs> It's good to be here. Well, uh, welcome. We wanted to, uh, the show is really about uh, trying to bridge the gap and, um, and provide needed information to residents about the things that are going on in their towns. And so to get the directors to come on to talk about it, um, you know, I think is, is a great thing. Summer is coming. It's almost here. Right? If, if we ever get out of winter. <laughs> you know what? I think that we're having uh, an extended springtime. That is true. You know, and a That's lot of true. people complain that we usually go from winter directly to summer and no spring. But we've had, a, I, I think, an, an, an amazing spring. Man, I wake up and it's crisp outside, yeah. you know, and then it kind of warms up a little bit to about 70, right? And then it cools back down a little bit, and, uh, and that's spring. That's true. That's true. But we're excited about the uh, summer coming up. So mm -hmm. in the township of Irvington, we have some wonderful, wonderful things, exciting things. Uh, for our residents, and we're doing that right now. It's in the makings right now. Okay, so what kind of things are, are do you have going on? Well, this summer is our summer, we call it our summer activities program, mm -hmm. and we currently have now about nine, ten sites that we're going to be doing during the summer. Our program starts July 3rd, and we run through the month of August. This is about a seven-week program, so when parents say, well, school is out, don't have nothing for our kids to do, no, 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 no. So they can come to the Gatlin Center, 285 Union Avenue, and we'll have these distributed throughout the schools as well, that they can register their kids ages 6 up to 14, 15 years old, and be a part of our summer recreation program. I mean, it's 9 a.m. in the morning until 5 p.m. at night. We serve them lunch, we serve them breakfast every day, Monday through Friday, and that's free. Free food, so free. <laughs> well, you know what, and we, but we talk. About, but you know what, 
it is it is something that's needed. I mean, one of the things that I found out when I was working in the school system uh, in Newark many, many years ago was that the kids came for the free breakfast program, right? I mean, they came for school, but they took advantage of the breakfast program, the lunch yes. program. And then when school was out, uh, you now run the risk of these kids not having a meal. This is true. And currently in our after-school program right now, in terms of our kids coming uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon when school is uh, over, mm -hmm. uh, we extend that program to our Chris Gatlin Center and to the great partnership that we've had is with the Irvington uh, Public School District. Our superintendent of schools has really been a great partner for us because we've been able to do programs and run those programs right uh, throughout the school. Those that were available to us that we um, were able to capture um, as well. So they have been a great, great help to us. And we'll be using schools this summer as well as part of our sites for our summer recreation program. That's great. One of the things, I look, I'm very impressed with the talent that um, your mayor and Irvington have put together. I've known you for a long time. Yes. Way back <laughs> when, when Gail was um, producing um, the Gospel Fest. The largest gospel fest outside of McDonald's Fest um, that brought the community um, uh, of gospel. Gail is a big gospel supporter, and the community supports her. And, and uh, Malloy has been a dear friend of ours for years. I mean, but the yes. talent, you know, of all the people you bring on your show, I think that he represents the, the longest history of someone between Newark and Irvington that I've seen um, do some incredible things in both cities. And I got to tell you, your, 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 um, your mayor is really thinking outside the box. I really like him. Now well, that well, I don't know him, but I hear <laughs> great things about him. you got to introduce me to him. But I hear, yeah. look, I drive through Irvington, your streets are clean. Yes. I drive through Irvington, your police are <laughs> active. Yes. I drive yeah. through Irvington, it seems as though that you're trying to fix, you know, it was always Irvington was connected to Blight, but I think Irvington now is becoming one of the cities in that triangle between Orange, East Orange, and Newark that really have solid leadership. Now, everybody's going to greet with him, but i got to tell you, his police officers are loyal to him, not because he made them take a loyal uh, approach. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that later. <laughs> but i got to tell we'll you, I, I've, watched, I've watched a lot of um, um, your shows, Eric, and Irvington has really taken their um, their leadership series, how they pick their leadership series. And i got to tell you, Donald, it's great to see you still there. Continuity well, is important. It is important, and one of the things I um, felt myself... Uh, uh, with uh, our current mayor, uh, Mayor Tony Voss, is that uh, he believes in the job and the work that you're doing, and he's not new to all of us. I mean, even prior, 12, 16 yeah. years ago, mm -hmm. he was uh, managing campaigns all around the city for some of those very uh, people who were elected into office. So he paid so his dues. He huh? paid his dues, That's and now true. that it is time, and he has been able to look at the different uh, series of mayors, let's say, who have come through uh, what was done, what was not done, and he's took an, an objective uh, approach and kind of separated that stuff out. And what he has done is he's thinking outside the box. The norms are not the norms anymore. I like that. you got to go outside the box, and you got to be creative. And he has a team of people who are around him who do just that. I mean, it's not just what I need and what I want, but what are we as a collective body building is able a to... Rebuilding a community. Yes. Yeah. How do we like rebuild it. this? Mm -hmm. and, and his position is, well, I don't want, you know, people to just... I don't want complainers and to deal with A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. I want the solutions to be able to deal with the problem. Well, at least right. he's open to it. And listen, I got to tell you, I go through Irvington, completely different place. You can't yes. take that away yes. from them. Completely. Yeah, I remember driving through Irvington and I'm like, whoa. Yeah. But you drive through Irvington now, and guess what? There's a lot of problems over the years because of the economic meltdown, mm -hmm. over the years because of a lack of funding. You know, I'm quite sure his taxpayers might feel a lot more comfortable now than they did before because there's some there's some relief on the way. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I, I mean, I, I've been watching him, and he's, he seems to have a lot of mature people in his council. Yes. His council is very, very effective in making yes. sure they get the things done with him because they, they seem to be working oh, together. Dude. Uh, well, that was one of, the things, that I, that's I like one that. of the things that I said when I first came in here. I, I remember I had an Internet radio show. I like that. And uh, the mayor brought me over to City Hall, and we sat in his office, and all the council were there. That's great. Oh, yeah. You know, and you could really see the team, um, you know, the idea that they really were trying to work as a unit 
to improve Irvington, to rebuild a community. I've had some history of working with council people that and mayors that work together. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. The results are phenomenal. Exactly. I mean, exactly. you see a huge return on investment when you do that. Oh, but yes. i got to tell you, to have Donald Malloy there doing that, um, it's just great. What, well, tell me, well, about, what other recreation stuff are you doing? Oh, wow. Well, the great thing is that mm -hmm. we, <laughs> that, that's sort of forward thinking with this mayor. We renovated the total uh, Chris Gatlin Recreation Center that's in the township. That's our center that's on 285 Union Avenue. We, he immediately came in and partnered with the County of Essex, right. and we were able to secure grants from the County of Essex, and then he was able to use community development funds right. and match those two entities together that we were able to do outside renovation as well as in fire. Man, we have a state-of-the-art uh, fitness room That's downstairs, right. a whole gym gymnasium uh, with which is never really uh, not in use. How are your kids? How, are your kids, how, how does the community like? It? How, how are the kids? Um, the the kids are really really enjoying because there's a multiplicity of programs that we're doing. Right. And what the mayor was smart enough to do is we partnered with five hundred one c three nonprofit agencies, mm -hmm. and we said to them, instead of me blowing up and have twenty twenty five people in a staff, how can we possibly save money? And we could save money by getting nonprofits involved mm -hmm. and then getting their volunteerism base to come in and run those programs. Well, we talked about that last year. I think I think I thought we talked about that last week. Mm -hmm. I'm already in the past, but we talked about that last week when we said that the nonprofits probably have some of the best trained um, oh, man. administrators and staff in exactly. the business. But you and have to know how to use them. them. Yeah, you, you have to know them. how to use right, them, right, man. Right. You know, they're there. You can't bully them. No. Do you know what I mean? No. You can't intimidate them. No. You have to recognize that they're partners in the community. That's it. And if you um, play to their strengths, you can benefit exactly. enormously from what they have to offer. And, and who's to run uh, programs that they generally do on a year-to-year -year basis week-to-week uh, -week basis, who to run better to run those programs than right. the people that they have in place? Mm -hmm. I don't have to train nobody. I don't have to come right, in and do right. this, A, B, C, and D. But you know what that's <laughs> part of, man? Again, it's part of building a community, right? Yes. It's part of recognizing that you're not one person that's going to get it done. Exactly. Um, it, it's willing to share the spotlight. It's all of those things. It's, it's putting ego to the side for the betterment of the community. All of these things are required. And when you have, and so when I see a mayor who's working with, with his council, and I see him working with these organizations. I see him working with people in the community and giving them, as they say in the street, giving them shine. It's a great thing. Let's see if we can take this caller. Go ahead and push that. Hello, caller? Yes, Anthony Smith. Anthony. Oh. Hey, Kevin. How you doing? Oh, so listen, Anthony, can, can, can we ask you to hold on one second? Sure can. All right, we're going to do that. So Anthony is our, um, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, what are you doing? Tell us what you're doing. Tell us what you're doing. Yeah, Lacey Davis last week. Now we got Anthony Smith. We want people to tell us what they're doing, wow. what they're doing in the community. So we got a segment that starts um, every Monday at 1030. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put the best and effective. I don't believe in the best and the brightest. We've seen what they've done. <laughs> we want the best and effective. Yeah. <laughs> well, We've seen exactly all the best right. and the brightest. But tell me one thing. Yes. What is the if you had one dream for for your your youth or your your department one big thing right that would take your city and to help our children to help your community grow what would be that one thing the one thing that I really uh, want to be able to deal with is to have a another recreational center that's just as equal to the Chris Gatlin Center wow. uh, across town, let's say. Wow. Because, I mean, Irvington is not a big city mm -hmm. or a big township, uh, but we do have north, south, east, and west. Right. But in our east ward, uh, I would like to join the two where kids in those school systems where we can do programs mm -hmm. and do programmatic things in the school system, but also build the after-school uh, population there where we can get them into something big, like a state-of-the-art center, well, that like that, like the Chris Gatlin Recreation Center. That's where we are. I mean, there's game rooms, there's video, arcades, and all of that stuff over at the Gatlin Center. We got boxing. We have a boxing ring downstairs that is second to none as well. I mean, we got coaches that come from combat with uh, Larry uh, Hazard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and his organization. Yeah. They are involved into our boxing program, AAU. We have uh, the 
Pee Wee, the Biddies, you know, we so got built the whole voice, yeah. uh, singing, piano, you name it. Oh my <laughs> goodness, man. Yeah. I believe your man. I believe your mayor and a team he has. He's going to make that happen. I just, I've just seen so much good work. Well, with him. the innovativeness of him and what he's doing, he's he out it. and very, very strong with our young people. Listen, he's very, very strong to our youth and very sensitive to our youth that mm -hmm. we want to be able to build upon well, the they are They are the future. That's right. right. I mean, That's it, right. it is the thing. And, and, and so, you know, we, we're going to have the uh, public safety director on next. And, and what I said to you guys, exactly, right? You guys have to work together because um, the big saying is if you don't give, what, it, uh, idle mind is a playground for the devil. Hey, that's what they say. That's true. So if you don't give these youth something to do, they're going to find something to do, and you may not be happy with what it is that they find. Look, and I so think that I think um, your mayor is going to end up being the mayor of the year for, for Essex County, New Jersey. I well, think I think I, 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 I got to be honest with you. I, I mean, I just, think he should be. I, I uh, think so he's too. done uh, so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a short period of time. It's not that a full uh, four years haven't even uh, right. expired yet, but he's done so much in a short uh, period of time. And when we came in, we hit the ground running. And he had an extensive outlay of what he wanted to do in this, and be effective in every ward but, in the township. But I think well, a part of being able to hit the ground running is, is there, there is something to be said about coming from the community, right? Because yes. if you come from the community, you know the things intimately that, imp that are impacting the community positively and negatively. And so if you have ideas, and again, if you're open-minded, <laughs> you know, you can, you can begin to work I, I on those think, things immediately. I think the other thing that he, he did yes. quickly, I think he did it quickly. Uh, not quickly. I think that he's open to it. He has a lot of elders around him mm. that, that he listens to, not take advantage of. He doesn't use them for, you know, his political gains. He says, listen, I want you to be a partner. You know, I, like, I know Levy Jones up there. I know a lot oh, of people yes. in Irvington. Yes. I'm friends with a lot of people up there, and they're really still actively helping him to grow. Exactly. And you can see the difference. And I think your recreation center idea is great because the more protective factors you have, the better our kids are protected, right? And you can produce kids that understand what community is. And then when you talk about using your nonprofits, to be able to partner with you to strengthen yes. your sec the sector, strengthen that sector in the vision, that's even, that's even, that's better. The great thing is that he is on board mm. with uh, a lot of things that I've done. And I'm batting pretty much, and I'm not bragging on myself, but it's that partnership that we talk about, uh, the Department of uh, Green Acres, right. State of New Jersey. I mean, over the years, cumulatively, we've been able to get at least $3.5 million out of them. So that speaks volumes in terms of where the resources are uh, in terms of awarding us those uh, grants. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to apply for them and do the work, but awarding those grants to us where we can effectively do stuff in our parks, look at uh, the, uh, Essex County. I mean, the park in Essex County, uh, in, in Irvington, which is Irvington Park, mm -hmm. There's an immense amount of money that we have now resourced, and the county has resourced to rebuild some stuff in our park. That's a hidden gem as well. Uh, well in when, the I was a, when, when I was a yeah. kid, <laughs> we used to trek from Newark mm -hmm. up Lines Avenue to go play in that park, man. It was an amazing place to be. I haven't been there since I was a kid, so I don't know what the condition is, but it was a gem when we were kids. Oh, yeah, definitely. And we just partnered with the state of New Jersey. Well, we're getting ready because we have awarded the contracts. Maybe this is what he can really talk about. Uh, our 40th Street Park uh, was awarded another additional $650,000 uh, mm. to do some extensive renovations in that park. And my dream for that building, and that's in the West Ward, but I wanted to extend that building. We, had, we have the uh, structure in place, but I wanted to enlarge that building so that community groups, community organizations can utilize that building, for for years, they've just had that little segment of space. Could nobody get in there worth mm -hmm. nothing? But now we're going to expand that building where community groups and organizations can utilize and have free will to invite their people to come out to wow. meetings, etc. So, Ms. Malloy, what I want to ask you to do uh, in the next you know minute or whatever uh, for the listeners, uh, where could they get information about different things that are going on uh, or get involved with what's going on in Irvington? 
Well, one of the ways they can get involved, those that have computers, you know, that's the technology wave mm -hmm. of this, of this uh, generation. So uh, go on our website at www.irvington.net and click on the Recreation Department. A page for Recreation will come up as well. Mm -hmm. We have information there. If you job opportunities for our kids, which I'm doing right now, mm -hmm. I mean, our website has been re really flooded with a lot of people who are applying online. And we've done about a hundred and some of those applications already. But also you can call 973-399-6597. And that's our main headquarters for recreation in the township. That's our Chris Scatlin Recreation Center, 973-399-6597. And please come out and register your, ki register your kids for our summer program now or after school program. doesn't matter. Now, what about summer camp? Do you have that going that's on? That, that's what we call summer activities. Okay. That's our camps and the different sites that we, mm -hmm. that we have during the summer. But they can come. Fill out your applications, uh, even online. Fill out your applications for registration for our summer program, and we're there for you. We've got a uh, friendly staff that will greet you when you open, we'll open the doors. We're located at 285 Union Avenue in Irvington, New Jersey. So... Right. We, 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 we want you to come, and we want our Irvington residents to take full advantage of all the opportunities for their kids. Well, right. I'm proud of you. Well, I'm, we're proud of My you, friend. man. Keep doing the good work. Please come here anytime. Use this platform as a way to get out information about what you guys are doing. I know you do flyers and other kinds of things in the community, but feel free this to call. Yeah, and say, hey, listen, I need to be on. We got this thing going on. I want to just tell the community about it. We'll be happy to invite you to come on. Well, I certainly would do that, Eric. Thank you so much for having and thank you for your love for the township of Irving. Absolutely. So when we come back, we're going to get into our segment, and then after that, we're going to bring on the director of public safety. We'll be right back. You are listening to the Eric Dawson Radio Show on 94.3 FM. All right, so we're, we're back, and uh, we're going to bring on our, our caller. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're going to bring Anthony on, and uh, and then we're going to bring on the uh, public safety director. Okay. Hey, thanks for holding on, Anthony. How are you, brother? I'm doing fine, Eric. How are you? I'm doing all right. We just had one of your dear friends on, Donna Malloy. I know. I, when I heard Don, I was like, wait a minute, that voice sounds familiar. <laughs> well, yeah, he was just asking me, he was just that, asking yeah. me um, why um, you um, you haven't been calling him for um, the gospel um, portion of your show. I'm, I'm confused about that, Anthony. <laughs> why haven't we called Donald? <laughs> yes. I told him that you'll give him a call. I'm only joking. Uh -huh. But, Anthony, anyway, um, thank you. You're the second... Um, person last week, the Lacey Davis was the inaugural person for our um, "Tell Us What You're Doing" segment, and I thought it was great to have you come on this week. We're going to be looking for Norkers or looking for people in Essex County that are doing great things, running great institutions, servicing their community, and um, we wanted to um, give you an opportunity to, to t tell us and tell the audience about what Lincoln Park is doing, where Lincoln Park has come, Lincoln Park has come from. Tell us a little bit about yourself. And, um, you know, and we can see if we can help you. Or we, um, we can talk about some things while you're saying that, and we can move on. Cool beans. So tell us what you're doing. Hi, my name is Anthony Smith, and I'm, you know, executive director at Lincoln Park Coast Cultural District. Uh, for those who don't know what, Lincoln, what, Link, what we do at Lincoln Park Coast Cultural District or how we even was created, uh, Lincoln Park um, actually... Uh, was created uh, s several years ago, when I say several, over 15 years ago, um, around a planning session, a charrette we had, uh, because we were looking at the bones of the city, and we looked at the bones of Lincoln Park, and we realized that, um, that you know, in the past it has been a cultural um, uh, haven there, you know, so... In the 30s and the 50s, it was called the Coast because it was the Black Red Light District. And when I say red light, uh, I mean in the forms of it was where all the jazz clubs were at. Savoy Records was down there. And so when we had this planning session and brought all of the uh, stakeholders, whether it was uh, from government, academia, artists, and just people were living in a community, we brought them together to see how can we rebuild this community and make it a sustainable community and using arts and culture and also sustainability, blending them both together to make sure that this will be a community that we can, uh, like the rebirth, and also that will be a, a 
lasting more than just 25 years, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of the housing that was being built during that time uh, was what they called Bayon boxes, and we just were being more progressive about what was going on. The whole concept really came out of Bali, which is uh, building alliances with local living economies. And so we looked at Lincoln Park in its totality and wanted to just make sure that we were building a, a, a community that was whole and complete that someone could live, work, and play in. So uh, we created the nonprofit organization Lincoln Park Coast from the history of the Coast Cultural District in 2002. I've been engaged in this process probably since 1998. Uh, when I was working on uh, the government side, uh, then transitioned over and started working as uh, many hats I wore over there, but I ended up becoming the executive director in the last two and a half years. Some of the product that we, uh, and the things that we do to engage this community, because there really was nothing going on in this community. They used to call it the bottom. You know, uh, you know there was no, it, it wasn't on a police grid. All the quality of life issues that you could think of was not happening. So we came in there and, you know, gave it an injection of everything. We knew that there was, it was a food desert. There was no place to eat, so we started community farming. There, you know, we, we looked at jobs. You know, there was no jobs in the area or people were looking for jobs. So out of pathways, out of poverty, we realized that we had to do some job training. So we did training around weatherization, solar panel installation, or all those things of that sort. Um, we did housing, but we took a different approach to housing and made sure that we built uh, all lead certified housing or Energy Star housing, housing that was a little more progressive and that would be more sustainable for the community. And, you know, we're very excited to say that we've built over 100 units of housing in Lincoln Park over the last six to seven years. And in addition to that, all the people who were land banking, what we did is that we primed the market. So there's over n now where there was nothing in Lincoln Park, there's probably over 400 new families in Lincoln Park. So the community has really, uh, is busting from the seams. But the key thing is that we use arts and culture as a vehicle to really drive this. Mm -hmm. And one of our homework projects is the Lincoln Park Music Festival, in which we're celebrating the 12th year this year, July 28th through the 30th. And we get over 60,000 people coming through the city of Newark and to visit Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park has now become a destination. So we're excited about that because where we were not on the map or we just was considered as a place where ill-gotten gain was happening and, you know, the drug institutions and all those different things. Now Lincoln Park is looked upon as a destination and people are really moving into the area because when you think about downtown, downtown is just one mile long. All the development was happening in the northern end of Broad Street, but in the southern end of Broad Street, you know, it was like the uh, forgotten land. And it's the most important, actually, area of, and I'm saying all of Newark is important, but in coming into the city of Newark, you come right off the viaduct from the airport, and that's the first thing you see. And so we've done a lot to really rebuild this community and, you know, put it back on the map, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So I'm glad, Kevin, you and Eric invited me on. This is just let people know that we're down there, we're change agents, and we're using the whole process. They, right now in urban planning, they call it creative placemaking. We were doing it early on, but it's when you use arts and culture as a vehicle to bring people together and to shift and change the community. Well, Anthony, let me ask you a question. Where, where do you live at, Anthony? I live in <clears throat> North Newark. Oh, you live in North Newark. Oh, okay. How I long have you been a Norker? I was born and raised in Newark, so I'll be 52, <laughs> so 52 years. 52. Been in Newark. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say that, and I ask that question because there's so much talent in Newark. And, you know, and what, I'm, what, I'm, what I've am what i been seeing is uh, a degrading of talent leading some of the most serious um, departments in our city or various organizations. And I just want everybody to know that we have a pool of people in Newark that have so much history, so much talent, uh, and they should be, I mean, we all support you, Anthony, you know that. But it would be great to know that, I want everybody to know that we have this kind of guy living in the North Ward that has built this community up the way that he did and sacrificed his life. He could have gone anywhere and done anything that he wanted to do. And I remember 20 years ago, 18, 19 years ago, when you walked into Gail's office because um, Anthony worked as her chief aide mm -hmm. um, for years and told her about Lincoln Park and how Gail had to go to Ron Rice and Sharp, James and Donald Tucker to convince them that we should be investing in Lincoln Park. That's why we have Lincoln Park today. 
And I think that there's been a continuation of support by the administration's move going from that day, which led to Anthony still being there to do the good work that he's doing. But I remember those fights that we had um, over the years about why should we give them all of that land? You know, well, you know yeah, he's an African. They were African Americans. They were running a, a very efficient nonprofit corporation. They had a vision, and the whole discussion was: Wait a minute, do they have the capacity to fulfill uh, their obligation to us to build out that that particular community the way that we they thought beneficial for the city? And I got to tell you, Anthony um, and and Bay Wilson, mm -hmm. they toiled in that community for years trying to get that community to grow in a way that we can talk about what Brooklyn looks like. They were doing it way before Brooklyn was even thinking about doing it, and wow. I give them credit for that. No, you're absolutely correct, uh, Kevin. I'm glad that you brought that up. You know, we uh, we were there, you know, when it when it was not in vogue to be <laughs> in uh, uh, Lincoln right. Park. You know, Baye was there. Right. Then, you know, we were supporting each other. We and Baye met as charter class of leadership Newark, you know, and he had a vision, and, you know, I believed in his vision, and when I was working for Gail, I was letting him know that, you know, the gentrification is happening in the city of Newark. The city is going to shift and change, but we have to make sure that we uh, really celebrate our history and our culture and Absolutely. our contributions to the city of Newark. And Lincoln Park it has been a vehicle for us to do so. And that's what the festival has been, because the festival is really an intergenerational festival. Not only do we program on the stage jazz, gospel, house, and hip-hop, and R&B, and work with the youth, but um, off the stage, we have a sustainable health and wellness village. Really we nice. deal with the youth. We do. We, we try to and we make sure that our food vendors and also our um, arts and craft vendors, a lot of them are from Newark. A lot of the stuff is, you know, made by hand. And it's, just, it's an opportunity to celebrate who we are as a people. And what I really enjoy about the festival particularly is that it's almost like a family reunion. I'm, I, I will say it's... For some, it's like their Woodstock or family reunion. Mm -hmm. But each year, people come yeah. and they see people once a year that they haven't seen, and they plan their family reunions and everything about coming to Newark, the city of Newark, Lincoln Park. And so, you know, Eric and uh, Kevin is also, and me and Kevin talk about this all the time. What we've done uh, through all that we've done at Lincoln Park, and particularly with the festival, we've really uh, have made an economic impact to the city of Newark. Get Social. Yeah. What? How much money do you think? How much money do you think you over the aggregate amount over the last decade or two? Well, ten years. You celebrated your what? Ten years last year? Twelve. So no, we're, we're, uh, two years. So this is our twelfth year. Twelfth year. Yeah. I know that it's over a million dollars. You know, I don't have the exact number, but you know, we have over sixty vendors there, and people on average uh, are spending fifteen dollars with each vendor. And so when you get those numbers together, you know, it's people are really spending their money. They look, they look forward to coming down there. But mm -hmm. also the money is not just happening with the small businesses that are at the park, but it's all the people who we pay, whether it's p personnel or or other vendors that we paid in order to erect this whole festival. Then, you know, the city of Newark benefits also because people stay there. They either stay at the hotels mm -hmm. or they, you know, go to the restaurants. They're taking public transportation. So I know um, when Arts Council did their whole report on how arts impact the state of New Jersey, or particularly in Newark, the number is really big. Well, I'm, but also, I'm going to cut you off, but I also want to say that he's benefited from um, the um, organic transference that we talked about on your right. show before. I, I believe that the, this administration, um, Barack's administration, has been very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. I think Absolutely. Patrick Council was very, very helpful. So everybody knows that Lincoln Park is not to be played with. That's not a political football. And I even, I dare say Booker did the same thing. So I think everybody understood the importance of Lincoln Park. And, and i got to give credit to those administrations for keeping continuity because you know how sensitive it, sensitive it is for a nonprofit to survive in this marketplace. Absolutely. They're not getting the support from the corporate community um, the way they should. And um, let me ask you a question, um, Anthony, because I know we got to get you off the air. Um, do you have a Go, um, GoFundMe page? We don't have a GoFundMe page to set up, but we can, you can go to our website at lpccd.org, um, and there's a donate button there, okay. and we take all, so we, uh, we need, you know, the thing about nonprofits, Kevin, that you brought up to be honest, is that we're competing for scarce resources, mm -hmm. and in urban communities that we work in, we have such a large task of things, issues that we have to deal with, but we don't have the resources really address many of them and so 
you know, if anyone is interested in supporting us, whether you're volunteering or you have services you want to provide, you know, in kind or even donate, just go to our website at LP ccd.org and there's uh, opportunity for you to support what we're doing in the community. We're really shifting and changing the community and we need everybody, all hands on deck. So Anthony, are you pushing a lot of traffic through your website right now? Um, are we? Yes. Okay, okay. And the donate button is working and people are, are finding it with, without a problem? Yeah, it's on the front page. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's the first thing you see. Okay. okay. All right. So, you know, I'll, I'll have a conversation with you offline about, you know, maybe some marketing needs that you, you guys might have in any way that I might be able to help. That would be very helpful. Okay. You know, uh, uh, and I've known Anthony for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Eric, you have. <laughs> That's my brother. <laughs> yeah, we've known each other for a very, very long time. But listen, brother, keep up the great work that you're doing in the community. The community needs you and needs more people like you. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, thank you. Keep you keep up the good work that you're doing because we need vehicles and that we can actually have platforms to be able to speak about what we're doing. Yeah, and it because makes a lot sure, of you times know what the other we're thing. In, uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. We're, a lot of times we're out there, you know, with our boots to the ground, but we don't have opportunity to have a conversation about what's really happening. All right. And so, Ant, we'll, we'll also talk offline about getting, you know, like a, a thirty or forty-five second commercial that we can air. On, yeah, on, yeah. on the station, mm -hmm. right, that talks about what you guys are doing. And as we get closer to the festival, I know you guys, you know, put out promotional stuff, but we'll also uh, be happy to air commercial announcing the festival coming up and, and all that kind of stuff, all right? So we'll talk uh, about those. Okay, Great work, okay. Anthony. Great okay. work, man. Thank you, brother. Hey, thank you. All right, take care. Take care. So that was, uh, that was a, a, gr a great segment yeah, right yeah, yeah. and and so now uh what we're gonna do is go to a hard interview um <laughs> with the director of public safety uh, from urbanton um so you're gonna want to put on your headset so you can hear us clearly and uh and any calls that may come in so this is tracy Bow uh bowers uh the uh public safety director in irvington um how are you man I'm oh good. well we got to share the mic there we go <laughs> Okay, I'm good, my friend. Excellent, man. So um, I want to start off by saying uh, congratulations last year. Uh, I mean, nobody wants to have any murders, right? <laughs> um, but when the mayor came in, when this administration came in, Irvington was averaging somewhere near 25 to 30 murders a year. That's wow. correct. Right? That's correct. And uh, last year it was down to four. That's correct. Incredible. We had a tremendous, tremendous success last year fighting fighting crime and it is to be uh we used to say it was good but it's more than good that's actually out outstanding when we look at those numbers and those uh that crime reduction so uh, what do you attribute it to well well it's a, it's a few things and for the most part it's historical data and statistics statistics cool data that we use to to fight crime at the heart of the issue is looking at crime mm -hmm. and it's data driven and for instance like a like a pen map you look at a map and you see where the crime is and you start putting pens on a map to identify homicides robberies and stuff like that and it's our job as administrators and the command staff to look at that crime and for the most part put them in mm -hmm. on those dots so you're using Comstat? That's correct. That's right. You're using Comstat. I'm correct. familiar with that. That's so correct. all of your lieutenants and captains are responsible for actually managing or identifying those levels of crime in your community. That's that's correct. And in, in addition to that, we ask our commanders. So I don't work 24 hours. So mm -hmm. those commanders that are there after I leave and administration leave, we they're forced with the notion that they have to make real time decisions right then in real time versus waiting for me to get to work and tell you what to do so it really empowers them to to be more res responsible to be honest with you and we have had success with that so we were i work on the notion that those commanders that we pay all this money to mm -hmm. the deputy chiefs right, and, the, right. and, the, and the captain so when i'm not there you get to get nine get to do 90 percent of what you need to do to keep the township safe and I get to overrule you on 10. So you de you, de you decentralized it where they are responsible and they have to, I guess they get back to you and report to you about what's going on? And that's, that's correct. Right. Because if, if, if I have to 
be at work 24 hours <laughs> right, a I day, know, man. I and you. everything stop right. when I leave, then we're not doing our job. But here's just another example of, what, I mean, Irvington picking a competent, you know, police director and, and understanding all the history of that town and understanding what it was going to take to reduce some of the crime because, you know, crime is kind of interesting on you know, mm -hmm. how you read it. But they're using Comstat, which I think is very good because I've seen that used from um, Director Santiago um, all the way up. So I remember when it was brought here to Newark. Um, um, back in the 90s and it was very effective too we had some of the we had i think we went from maybe 150 down to maybe um 50 some odd homicides i mean it was incredible um and i think the same thing happened after him um whoever used it appropriately saw a huge reduction but let me ask you a question how are you dealing with the border issue irvington east orange you know because we're all border to each other how are you dealing with that well we have a border patrol we partnered with newark um right. On a, cause as you know, we're surrounded by Newark on, on two sides, mm -hmm. right? And we have uh, officers working with Newark police officers to 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 combat those border patrol issues. So we are having success in that area as well. So, um, in terms of uh, partnership, um, you know, former uh, New York City Police Commissioner um, William Bratton, mm -hmm. him and his him and uh, I forgot his uh, his partner who who. Who they came out with the book, but yeah, and the book was called. I know you're talking about. Yeah, the book was called "Collaborate Col or Perish." Yeah, perish, right. right? So that statement alone is it speaks uh, volumes. I'm trying and, to remember who his partner and, was. Yeah, I, right. I remember. Yeah, I you're mean, right. but just the title of the book, "Collaborate or Perish." That's that's. How long were you on the police force? Well. Yeah, like give a little the, background, like, because background? we talk about qualifications, yeah, right, and people right. being qualified to do the jobs. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your background. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I was. Well, actually, I was born in East Orange for a short time, but then we moved to Irvington when I was in the first grade. Mm -hmm. So I went to elementary school there, mm -hmm. middle school there, and Irvington High School. Wow. Okay. And after that, I went to the Navy. Right. And then a short time after I got out of the Navy, I came on the Irvington Police Department in 1990. 1990, wow. Okay. Right. And so I went up through the ranks, all the way up to the rank of captain. And in 2014, when the mayor became the, the mayor, he selected me to be his police director. That's great. Um, Education-wise, I have a, a BA from Philly Dixon University, and you know, just work harder. So I had the uh, the education, the aptitude, and the attitude, you know, mm -hmm. to make us successful. But but, but but the other thing you have is you're homegrown. You, I think you're going to say homegrown, right. Right, right? Which is important because when we talk about policing, we talk about community policing. Absolutely. Right. And and and, and so for you to have come from the community to have gone through elementary school, middle school, high school, um, and to be a part of community all your life, you know the cracks and crevices. You know all the things that are going on. And so from an intimate level, uh, you can deal, not just the numbers that you talked about in that pen chart with those little pens in it, um, <laughs> but you know the people. Absolutely. Well, let me, Absolutely. Ask, let me ask you a question. Um, if um, so, you were born. I mean, you were you lived in East Orange, but you really lived you lived in Irvington all your life, That's right? That's correct. What 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 do you believe was the biggest change to reduce crime in your in your town outside of the technical part portion of it? Do you believe that the police have a better relationship with the community or That's the young that. people that are you know eff being effective negatively out there because of a lack of education right. and so many lack of opportunities? How are they, how are you doing that? Because it's just not. Looking at statistics. Well, well, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Well, when I became the the police director, one of the first things that I did, I oh. re I reintroduced. We're going to take a break. Right. Right. I like that question. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, going to answer the question. question. We'll be right back in in, in about five Good minutes. Time. After the break. Radio ninety four point three. Bring it. Dance hall. Great question. We'll take so a question when we come back. Hip hop and R and B. African, <laughs> disco, yeah, but oldies but goodies. Hi, this is Jerry Jackson. We're bridging the gap. Seriously. Blast Radio 94.3, New Jersey. Hi, this is McGoomin Movie, Box Truck for Rent, for all you like moving me, anywhere within the North East Orange, 
Irvington Orange Erie, $50 a trip from Monday through Thursday, $60 from Friday through Sunday. Call 862-279-9300. That's 862-279-9300. You know what I am doing? Downloading the Western Union app. I need to send money to my auntie in Nigeria. You know what I am doing now? Checking today's exchange rate to Nigeria on the Western Union app. Now, I'm sending my auntie money to help her with her groceries. Download the Western Union app today. Use it to check today's exchange rate and send money to loved ones in Nigeria. Western Union, moving money for better. Western Union makes money from currency exchange. Carefully compare fees and exchange rates, which may vary and are subject to change. NMLS number 90693. For the most authentic Caribbean food in town, check out Sunsplash Caribbean Bakery and Restaurant. They got a natural organic juice bar that'll get your day started right. Like the Power Punch, the Feed Juice. The Mega Green, Roots Like the Immortal, and The Resurrection. And peep this, they have an extended bakery department that whips up my favorite, the Hot Hard O' Bread. White or wheat, that's your choice. If you're feeling hungry, just grab a bite. I can pop the idol of vengeance. Mix the needle for the commune parades. Serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They also serve vegans and vegetarians. With the idol stew and the the soul jerk salmon and mango tilapia. And of course, they got the usual curry goat, oxtail, brown stew chicken, jerk chicken, and so much more. I mean, their menu is extended and they're highly rated. Your best bet is to stop by or give them a call. They're open Monday through Wednesday, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., Thursday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., and Sundays, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. They're located at 56 Main Street in Orange, New Jersey, and can be reached at 973 395-3777. Let your food be medicine. Eat well, live longer. I'm David Shepard and I endorse this commercial. Yo, this is Splash Radio at the number one radio station in New Jersey. How are them? Well, I know Mr. G represent for 94.3 FM Splash. Radio, we just splash out the music on them. Mm. I'm sorry. That wasn't I'm it. Sorry. Yeah. It was my other intro, but <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. When it's, you multitask, it's Monday. It's, Monday. Mo it's Monday, man, and we're trying to get it going. <laughs> but we're here with um, uh, Director uh, Tracy Bowers, um, Public Safety Director from the Township of Irvington. And um, before the break, Kevin asked the question. Actually, repeat the question. Well, Kevin? the question was: I, I, I'm, I'm, I know that you know you do a very good job of mapping out where crime is and and all the elements of how you reduce that, but how did you get your community um, to get more involved, and how did you work with the kids? Because, you know, our kids now are so challenged, lack of a lack of job opportunities, you know, um, they've, they've been allowed to socialize themselves, you know, there there's more gang activity happening in our community. So how did you get your community to work with you, and how did you get those kids to trust you? Because in our communities, it's about trust when it comes to police. Having you there as an African-American leader that's competent, not just African American is important, and having a plan is important. But how did you get right to where the real issue was? How did you do that? All right. So when I first became the police director, one of the first things that I did is reinitiated the the parking walk. The parking walk. That's where the cops will get out their car, and they'll walk for a period of time and get back in the car, go to another area, and. That has been a, a tremendous success for us because we, we embrace technology and we love technology. We sit here in this room and we can do things that we couldn't do before. But if you think about it, there's nothing that can replace a beat cop. <laughs> that's true. There's nothing that can that's replace true. a beat cop. Yeah, Somebody that you can walk true. up to, shake their hand, yeah, Beat cops were important when I was right. growing up. Right. Right. Listen, and it's, it's had a tremendous impact on the way we fight crime. In addition to that, you know, the weather's going to be getting pretty good now. The cops go, they go on the bikes, mm -hmm. ride around the community, and it's just a, a way to access the community in a way we didn't, well, we forgot about it. Right. We forgot right, about right, it. Right, right, so, Now, do you have a lot of police that live in the community in Irvington? Well, right now, to become a police officer, you have to be a, re a resident of the community, but after a while, you can move out. Mm -hmm. So most of our young cops, they are from, the, from Irvington. Um, 
and they they're right there. They have mm -hmm. the advantage that I had as well, of you know, knowing the nooks and the crannies and the geographical mm -hmm. layout. So that's been an asset to the police department. There's always been a discussion about getting police to live in our community, and you know, I think while while they're in the um, while they're training to be in the police department, there's a certain period of time they have to live in Newark. But a lot of them leave Newark. I mean, leave Newark or Irvington or whatever because. It, they, they, their, their problem was where they were so close to it every day, mm -hmm. right? Well, you shouldn't have taken a job to me. I mean, that's mm -hmm. something that we should be dealing with. But the state, you know, and the PBA and all of those other union uh, um, organizations, they've been fighting um, cities like Newark and fighting cities like Irvington and East Orange from having it full time. You have to live in your city to be able to collect a check and be a police officer. You have to live in the city. That's and they've right. been pushing back for years. It would be interesting to see if this governor, um, whoever becomes governor um, in the next year, would be able to uh, try to change that law. It's just not about sending it down here and, and, and getting him to sign it. You're right. going to have to fight all of the other special interests exactly. that are right. against it. So you know, it's right. a tough thing. But I believe that if your community is growing the right way, and your education system. And the police, is, uh, the police, the police don't want to stay. They don't yeah. want to stay. They want to stay. stay. Great stay. community, Absolutely. great schools. How, you know, great. How's your relationship with all of your other anchoring institutions, like your nonprofits and your churches and um, uh, smaller community organizations and businesses? How is how's your relationship? Well, what, well, one of the great things that we do in the, in the township of Irvington, we have the community meetings. These community meetings with, like, for the block associations and even the, the, the council meetings, mm -hmm. it's a chance to really develop a relationship with the community, the businesses, the churches, uh, schools. Right. It's That's a tremendous right. time for us to come together and yeah. have a conversation of, of, about crime, right. knowing that the police right. don't know don't know everything. Right, absolutely. And that we need you to partnership right. with us to right. get... Um, a lot of information that's going to help us fight crime. And one of the things that we talk about in those meetings is I always say how we want a partnership with people because we need you. I said we need you to be mm -hmm. our partner. Right. And now, now are these meetings well attended? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. See, and, that, that engagement you know, part, they're community right. meetings. They're right. community meetings, not staff meetings. But, you know, he's having community meetings. Right. He's not right. having staff follow but, you all around the city. And, right. you know, but that's what's important. But for those those community meetings, one of the things that we do that's that's unique. All of our administration go. So you got the you got the me the public safety director. You got the business administrator. You got the mayor, the health director. All of us go as a coalition, and we go. We are able to answer so many questions. Doing that but you're not going to fill the room to say that you had these number of bodies. You're going so that you can be a resource to the community when yes, you have absolutely. questions. Absolutely. And that's a difference. That's a as, difference. Yeah. As, that's the, as, I, as, I call that the Sharp James model. As, absolutely. We used to have to and do that all and the time. It's, and it, it is really, it's really, it's really an information session where we give out information and we also get information. And so that's how you build trust. That's yeah, how you build, build trust and communicate. Your, the, um, your community residents, can they contact you if yeah. they find an issue? Um, can they call you directly? Yes. Yes, they can. They can. I have an open, I have an open door policy, that's great. and if they want to go an anonymous, uh, that number is nine seven three three nine nine eight four seven seven. So if they have a, a, a citizen complaint or concern or information about crime, they can relay that to us in a, on an anonymous basis, and then we can go out and and find out what's going on and respond appropriately. So now, weather is getting warm, and in urban communities in particular, when the weather gets warm, uh, folks start thinking crime may be on the uptick right um, what what initiatives are you guys putting in place um, in preparation for the possibility of that well thank you for that question but every year we come out with a summer crime plan because you know right before the summer we think we, you got to think of it as <laughs> spring training <laughs> we're in spring training right now mm -hmm. right. the real game like begins when it start getting yeah. hot yeah. At 70 June. and over right you yeah, yeah. 70 80 right? that's the, the real deal long. and that's when the, the game is the, the game is the game is on because the kids are out of school more people out in the street more people is it's, it's hot right, yeah. people agitated and that's where like uh director malloy came came into play so they need recreation things to do to keep them off the street but um, specifically we have a summer crime plan and that is when we take again all our resources that we possibly can within the police department and get them out on the street in those areas where we know yeah. or project yeah. crime is going to be based upon I, I, I think Irvington is going to be the model I mean between East Orange and Irvington um, you got Shilly, Shilly Coley 
a seasoned police officer, female. She's mm -hmm. leading the, the department there, and you have yourself leading the department there. All of you know about urban issues and urban how urban cities need to be formed when it comes to community policing. And i got to tell you, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what's happening in East Orange and what's happening in, um, in, in Irvington. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you drive through the city, yeah. you know, it's like, wow. It's like, look, I drive to East Orange here, right? I can tell you the one thing I pay attention to. There's no trash on the street when I'm coming up that street. Right. I, I said, that's right. interesting. Now, that's just not one day. For the last several months I've been coming here, I've been paying attention to that. If you go over to Irvington, right, if you go into the downtown district, it's one of the most bustling oh, downtown. Man. I think you still have right. UEZ over there, right? That's uh, the UEZ, I think they got rid of you. Yeah, I mean, gone. UEZ might no, it's gone now, right? Yeah, gone. But anyway, but they have one of the mo one of the most robust UEZ programs in the state, Irvington. Mm -hmm. So I mean, they got some history up there. They have some mature leadership up there. You know, they hold themselves accountable. They talk to each other, and it's great to see a, a dynamic um, police director like yourself and Sheila Coley on the other side That's doing great. that. That is great. You know, I don't. Um, and um, the orange um, police director. Um, what is his name? Um, Oh, uh, Warren. Warren. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, Kyle so Warren. yeah, Kyle so Warren. he's connected right. to the community. Oh, we're gonna have him on soon too. He was doing all of this. Look, he's been, he was doing all of this work prior be, before he became a police director. So you got some young, dynamic African American men and women that understand community policing, understand how you build your police department and connect that to a broader, a broader plan for your community right. development or not. I just think that's incredible. They should be commended for that. Yeah. You know, got talent. I like talent. Right. You know, you might be my buddy, but you're not right. coming to work with me if you don't have the talent. That's right. You know, you start here. You know, everybody has to start here. And what I'm seeing in those towns, they have talent that have been consistent. Right. You know, it's like leadership that's really working, and it's not coming to work to look pretty every day. I agree. And I appreciate that. I like that. So in that's Irvington, um, do you guys have a, um, is there a gang issue in <coughs> Irvington? Have you guys experienced any, like, yes. real? Yes, we have a, you know, gang factions that mm -hmm. we we channel our uh, law enforcement efforts toward their activities and mm -hmm. what and how we do that is we have a uh, an intel unit and that intel unit comes out with a with a plan to give those people mm -hmm. the attention that you know they that the community needs to give them because we either know two things either they're going to be liable to commit a crime or be a victim of a crime. Mm. So we mm. try to mm. occupy that space so so we have success in fighting crime. So that's that's part of our summer plan is mm. our intel. How many police intel. officers do you have? Roughly 160. 160, okay. Wow, you do all of that with 160? You, what? <laughs> yeah, wow. we got, yeah. Man, well, you do well, all we, <laughs> we, move, we move them around constantly. Wow. That's why I said about my commanders, you got to be able to adjust on the fly. If yeah. you have a bunch of robberies in another area, you can't... Just use one or two cards. You got to shift your resources right. based upon right. the information you got right. Right. That's in great. real time. So I give them the ability to do that. So we do you think you need more money for your budget? You, you, you and your mayor worked well together. I'm quite sure you guys right. are trying to find resources to oh, do we, that. Oh, we can always use more. Yeah, great. More, yeah. more money. I know. Yeah, man. And I know. grants and resources because that's more things that you can do to help, help to help fight crime. Do you have a grants division inside your department? Well, we have a. Well, the town has a grant. Uh, administrated, and then we have our own. Within yeah, because I know if 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 I know Joe Santiago well, I know over the years he was right. big on having a whole division that just did grants, getting money from the Justice Department. Getting there was a lot of money at that time. You had Clinton right. money at that oh, time. Yeah, a lot of it, you don't have Clinton money anymore. Yeah, you don't That's have true. Clinton money anymore. But That's true. but you know there was a lot of money on the ground for community policing, community policing, those kinds of things. So I just thought that was. I just wanted to know that. Yeah, that's correct. Well, listen, like I said to uh, Director uh, Malloy, if there are any things that you'd like to share with the, uh, you know, our, our audience at large, mm -hmm. uh, please feel free to either call in, and you can always do that, say, hey, listen, you know, I got a couple, you know, can I have a couple minutes of air time? You can stop in always. Right. I'd love to have the, nice. you know, the personal uh, interaction. But if you need to call in, uh, you need a public service announcement put out there uh, to let people in the community know what's going on, please feel free to use this as a platform to do that. I oh, appreciate that. All right. Appreciate hey, brother, so keep much. up the good work, man. Thank I, you, I, I trust that the uh, spring training uh, <laughs> is complete, <laughs> that the muscles oh, are stretched and everybody's ready because um, summertime is coming. That's um, right. I'm talking, listen, that. congratulations, man. Thank Team Irvington is free.
pretty good. Appreciate that. Hey, congratulations. That. I never met you before, but this is right. great, man. I like that. Thank, yeah. you. thank you for having you know, me. I've been around. I'm old. So, you know, you guys are young, you know. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, brother. Hey, oh, thanks. Man. Thank you as well. Appreciate it. And that. listen, have a great day. All right. You're listening to the Eric Dawson Radio Show right. on 94.3 FM. Appreciate that. So, right. listen, um, uh, while we get ready for the next segment, um, uh, those were fantastic. Those were fantastic uh, interviews, I think. And thank you, brother, for your time, man. And and this is kind of what we want to do. This is a, a neighborhood show, and we want to be able to bring folks from, uh, not only from the community, but leadership in the community, leadership within municipalities to be able to talk to you guys about what is it they're doing. I mean, they're normal people. They're real people, and they're you know, trying to improve the quality of life for you guys. So when we have a public safety director on who's talking to you about the things that he or, you know, in some cases we may have a she is doing to try to improve the quality of life for you. For you guys to get engaged in helping be a part of building the community uh, is important. So, you know, we hope that the information that you hear, the passion that you uh, hear and see for those of you guys who are tuned in live on, on Facebook, uh, you know, will will guide you guys to become, you know, a greater part of the community and a greater part of their effort to improve the quality of life. So I was excited to have these guys in. And, you know, we're going to reach out to more municipalities because, uh, again, it's important for you guys to know what's going on. So I want to thank you for that. Now, uh, when Kevin comes back, we got a couple things that we will be uh, talking about. We're going to uh, we're going to delve into uh, Donald Trump. We're going to delve a little bit uh, more into the article that we were talking about um, in, in terms of how Germany is uh, has structured uh, their uh, workforce development uh, plan, um, and then uh, and then we're going to talk uh, talk about schools. Yeah. Well, anyway, I was excited about those two interviews, man. They were good. They were you good. Know. I mean, I'm, you put you're, you're bringing some good people. You know, well, they're young, they're young, man, dynamic. Young, dynamic, young. talented like people. So when we talk about raising the bar, Ken, when we talk about having qualified leadership, right, that's what it looks like. Well, yeah, it, it, I mean, i got to tell you, I, I'm impressed. And I've known Donald Malloy for years. I know his capabilities. And to know that he's up in Irvington, and I, I don't, I've never met this young man before, mm-hmm. but he's really growing into a real strong police director. It's tough being a police director. It's tough, but uh, he... You know, he his job, I can see that he's committed to his job. It's just not political for him. And, you know, a director has to be political occasionally, be sensitive occasionally, but he's building a strong police department with 160 people. That's pretty good. And you had Ted Green on your show sometime. Had Ted Green on your show. The future mayor of um, East Orange. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's one of the things, you know, Sheila Coley and what they're doing in East Orange has been very consistent. Yeah, we're working. You know, to, we're working to get her on. Oh, she's oh, yeah. she's oh, she's exceptional. You know, um, she's because exceptional. again, now that we're getting Dynamic into lady. the warmer weather, it's important. I I think uh, it's important for them to have this as a platform to talk uh, to the community at large about you know how to create a safer uh, community, right? How to increase quality of life for the. Yeah, summer. listen, I, I just got to tell you, I'm encouraged. I you know, know. I, I I don't have a lot of hope for some of the leadership I've seen thus far, mm-hmm. but the people that you've brought on the show that I've had the opportunity to listen into listen in on and the people that I've been here you know and dis- having these kinds of discussions you know and they're pretty and they talk to you in a way that is respectful and they're trying to really speak to their audience mm-hmm. and empower their audience to give them the opportunity to speak to that audience like that is pretty good I like that and you know what I love about it too that they know um, that this is a hot seat man that you know our, our goal here is to uh, provoke accountability right and so when folks are doing a great job we'll Highlight it. We'll talk about it. But when they're not, we'll question it. Um, for the well, yeah, the yeah. Time. I mean, he answered all of those questions. Oh, he did. I mean, and the same thing with Donald Malloy. You know, oh, and dude, what they're doing with recreation right, areas. Right. Just imagine if they had another three million dollars. What that? What a difference that would make in Irvington. I mean, just look at Anthony Smith. I mean, you know, we talked about how um, the phil- philanthropic community has d- divested itself from supporting anchoring institutions mm-hmm. like Lincoln Park or any other institutions, and they have to become very, very creative, which puts a stretch on their bottom line. And you know, these intermediaries, these guys that are sitting in the rooms and talking about who we should give money to and who we shouldn't give money to, they're making decisions that are killing organizations that are the, the backstop for um, some of the most important issues impacting our community, like 
you know, our youth, like our young women, I, I mean, teenage pregnancy and education, and, you know, they have just divested themselves and have taken them through this lengthy, arduous process of only getting 25000 or we'll give you 25000 but you have to give us 452 reports, and then you would have to go, and you have to do all of this training, and these guys are some of the best trained people in the country. Some of these executive directors, the best train, they should actually be running major departments in our government, and you will see efficiency, you will see all the things that we, we seem to expect from those nonprofits inside, you know, what's happening in our government. What, what we're seeing now is not that. We have no talent, and I'm so impressed by um, Well, what Director Bauer said uh, off air uh, was important. He said, you know, when you get a mayor that comes in, he or she doesn't know everything, right? So um, it is very, very important that the people they surround themselves with are brilliant in their own respect. Let's so that, And then beyond that, that you have a level of trust so that when uh, those folks who you hire or bring in around your circle come in with ideas, that you value them. Listen, when, 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 going, when going into an office or anything that you're taking over, you should do an assessment immediately, mm -hmm. right, of your talent, of, of what your, your financial, your inputs and outputs, what your financial um, um, capabilities are. Mm -hmm. It's basic things you do. But the first thing you do is you got to pick the right talent. You got to. You got to pick the right talent. So you can't go around making excuses. You know, you got to pick the right talent. And I'm very hard on that. If you're not capable, if you don't have the capacity, you can't work with me. Right? Because you got to be really quick on your feet because we're developing institutional science for organizations and companies that want a quick response to their needs. So if you're coming in and you're not thinking, I I'd rather you challenge me all day and I'd rather you say, listen, we need to do it this way and let me look at it as opposed to just sitting there collecting a check and walking around the hallways. I agree. You know, and that's what we have now. That's I mean, we so have. we have to change that. We have to get comfortable with great minds working for us. We have to get comfortable with great minds challenging us. We have to get comfortable with great minds sitting in a room and saying, hey, listen, even though that might be your friend, he, doesn't des he, he shouldn't be here. Well, but, but I always go back to the fact that if you don't have folks in the community who are pressuring it, you know, so when you look and see what that looks like, when you see what a mayor's cabinet looks like, or you see what a governor's cabinet looks like, or you see the people that other elected officials have hired around them, if you believe that those people are not qualified to get the thing done, then it's incumbent upon you to raise your voice about it. Otherwise, things are going to be the way they are. But speaking about... Um, <laughs> about hiring the right people around you. I'm looking at the fumbling and bubbling in Washington, man. Oh, man. Everything Trump. You know, I like them. Everything Trump. Everything Trump. I mean, listen, the, the, the Republicans, the, the Republicans uh, are, are actually negligent. Um, you know, they are not coming out and, and attacking this, this their president, I should say, or even having any discussion about making any changes. Because, you know, we would know that if there was a private me meeting being held with the leadership of the, um, the Senate and or the ca uh, Congress, we would know. Because the, pr the, the press right now is hot on all of this. So they, you would pick up on it. So actually, they're co-signing, you know, his treachery and his... Uh, his autocratic ways. But there right? are some things that he's getting done, aren't they? Not one thing. I, I, I don't understand. Yeah. I don't, I, just tell me. I, I know what he's getting done. He's proving to everybody in the world that he's absolutely crazy. <laughs> he's getting that done well. He's getting a couple things done. Okay. He's, he's getting a couple things done. Actually, I sent to my brother. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I can access it. So I, maybe I shouldn't have stepped into that. You should um, But uh, I sent him a list of some things that, um, you know, that they had done. Uh, uh, you know, people have mentioned that you know he's been working on. So if I can, if I can find that and defend my statement, uh, <laughs> yeah, you better defend your statement because I told you, you, you know, know, I'm getting ready to call a therapist for you in a minute you know. because this guy, um, I, I don't know. I mean, you got to know it's only going to get worse. It's not going to get any better. You know, I don't see any um, anything coming. There was an article <laughs> and. Um, the New Yorker called Firing Comey was a grave abuse of power, right? And it talked about how in the 1970s during the Watergate, um, um, the Watergate um, crises, mm -hmm. how several Republican leaders, you know, basically got out of their chairs and walked up to um, the White House and, and told President Nixon, your time is up. You know, it's not about party, it's about country. And the next day he resigned. And I think that this is what's going to happen with this president. You know, I think that um, this says here on August the 7th, 1974, a trio of Republican politicians made a journey from Capitol Hill to the White House. Senators Barry Goldwater, we all know him, 
Hugh Scott and Representative John Rhodes, you know who John Rhodes is, right, had dedicated their professional lives to conservative movement and to the electoral fortunes of the Republican Party. But on this occasion, they chose to put the interests of their country ahead of partisan concerns of the GOP. Now, listen, put their country ahead. So we're so split in this country um, based on ideology, insane ideologies, that we don't have those kind of leaders doing that anymore. They have come to level with Richard Nixon, their fellow Republican and the President of the United States. The three men told Nixon that the wounds of Watergate have finally cut too deep. His party was abandoning him. It was time for the President to go. He announced his resignation the next day. Now, we need to have that happening. We need to see that happening right now. This guy is going to be traveling all around the world on a world um, when um, um, foreign trip this, um, these next couple of days. And God knows what he's going to be doing to us um, and representing us around the world. You know, we have the young Macron. I think it's Macron in, in France now. We have Merkel in, in, in Germany now. We have um, the Chinese um, um, chancellor that's getting ready to do a, one of the biggest um, um, infrastructure, global infrastructure programs, right, roads and bridges that's going to connect China to the rest of the world. I mean, over a trillion dollars of investment. And we're here dealing with a guy that's looking at TV every day, calling reporters and telling them that they are not, you know, reporting outright about him. I mean, this guy is really scary. I mean, narcissistic, I, I, that, that's, that's a calm word. You know, hubris, that's a kind word. But um, it just, and it says here's a great question in politics today is when or wh whether any Republican will undertake similar trip to White House or Donald Trump. Throughout the hundred plus days, Trump has proved himself temperamentally. Now, we talked about that when he was running for office, right? right? And intellectually unfit. Now, when you take temperamentally and intellectually unfit, that really says a lot. Okay, so that that's something that we need to deal with as a nation and as a community because the, the, the communities that are going to suffer the most are um, communities of color. I mean, you got Sessions now reversing Obama's um, um, laws. You got them attacking um, the Affordable Health Care Act. I mean, people are losing their um, losing their um, health care. Um, you have them now talking about giving huge tax breaks to the wealthy. Right. I mean, this guy is anti people. This guy is anti-democratic. Forget about being a Republican or Democrat. He's just not a good human being. I mean, so and, and there's no continuity to it either. It's no plan. You, if, you, if you're going to do something, at least have a plan. But, but uh, right. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pull this thing up to defend myself. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, um, what, what, what I will say is this. I, you know, I listened today to Morning Joe. Yeah. And I, I'm listening to the discussions about, um, uh, well, let, let, let's take the uh, the Affordable Care Act. Right. Um, I don't think that, and, and, and the jury is still out. There are a lot of people, at least the information that I'm reading, is that, uh, well, firstly, it's not done, right? It right. was a proposal. It's not going to make it through the, the Senate. Senate. Uh, but I think it's a negotiating um, tactic to start somewhere and then to move closer uh, to the middle, but still kind of be where it is that you want to be. Um, there is evidence, though, Kev, that um, you know that the Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare, um, in some areas just isn't working. It needed to be, I don't know, repealed and replaced, but needed to certainly be tweaked uh, or reformed. And, you know, and, and there were people who were being priced out of um, out of health care. There were still a lot of people who didn't have health care. Uh, there were um, uh, agencies and doctors that were pulling out of it. And so something needed to be done. Listen, all I know is 25 to 30 million people are going to be out without insurance. And a lot of people um, that have this, uh, uh, really concerns about critical what care. What happens if it goes through critical the passes? Care, and I don't care. think it's going Listen, to. There is no way that you can do something so big that you won't have problems. Right. But a lot of those problems, if, you, if we dig deeper, a lot of those problems are being straightened out, right? But on, it, on the core principle of it, we all believe that every American should have adequate health care. I agree with right? that. And the whole Obama, we want to call it Obamacare, was to focus us, focus us on that issue. Health care is primary to your life. 
health care is primary to your community's existence and health care is pro- and it has a positive impact on not just creating opportunity or creating jobs, which I think the Obamacare or Affordable Health Care Act did, but it actually assures you as an American that we that, that this country values your most important um, physical uh, being, which is your, is your health care. So whatever problems they had, right, it had, I think over time it would be straightened out. Medicaid, Medicare had to go through that. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac had to go through that. Any huge entitlement program had to go through some iterations and some changes. But what they're saying is they want to repeal it. They want to repeal it. They want to get rid of it right. without even having a plan, well, that, right. without even knowing what it, the impact it was going to be. I think just recently there's a young lady that um, – pre-existing, um, you're talking about pre-existing um, health issue, there was a young lady in her car, it was on Facebook, and she actually was sending a message to the president suggesting that the mere fact that he even did what he did in, in attempting to repeal um, um, the Affordable Health Care Act was going to have a major impact on her child, either living or dying. I mean, so this woman was in her car Obviously, must be having a bad day and not realize, not not knowing if her kid was going to be able to get the not only the health insurance that she needed, but the medicine that um, she needed. You know, so you know, pre-existing um, um, issues, a pre-existing health care, giving them access to if you have a pre-existing order. This what is it called? Pre pre-existing um, condition condition mm-hmm. is very important. That's very critical. I mean, so we got to, you know, I just think that he's reckless. I think he's irresponsible. I think he doesn't have, a, he just, this guy's not reading anything. He did a photo op with those um, white men with power on the, on the lawn. Yeah. He did a photo op with the African-American uh, uh, um, deans, I mean, um, leaders of um, the HBCUs, right? All he's interested in is doing a photo op and saying he's doing a great job. He, has, he's not, he, has, he doesn't understand anything he's signing his name to. Right, you get, first thing he got in the office is that we're gonna lock up all Muslims and ban you out of the country, right? I mean, that's not a confidence builder. <laughs> then he said he was gonna get rid of NATO. Then he came back and said, "Well, I'm not gonna get rid of NATO." Then he said, "You know what? I'm gonna. Um, we're gonna have to." Now he wants us to get into a war with Korea. You know, now we have South Korea and China, which can negotiate with Korea, uh, North Korea better than us. Mm-hmm. You know, so he, then the following week he drops the largest bomb ever dropped on twelve people in the desert <laughs> underneath the ground. <laughs> like, God, this guy's crazy, man. I mean, I, that, I mean, he's doing it to himself. I mean, so you got to help me with that one, man. I mean, I couldn't even get a guy to benefit of the doubt. We went from no drama Obama to insanity. I'm telling you. Well, that well, I would say that it's, it's, it's a lot of drama, and I think in a lot of cases there's some insanity. Um, but uh, you know, but he's still a work in progress. So a work in progress. A work in progress. Oh, man, you're kidding me, man. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. Right now. Don't you dare look. A hundred and what? what, 15 now, 20 days? About 120 days. 120 days. Mm -hmm. He now fires Comey. He now jeopardizes um, Rosenstein's um, professional career. Let's talk about the fire of Comey. Right. Right? So... Hasn't been done since um, Clinton, William Sessions. but, but, But both Congress and Senate agreed that William Sessions should have been... Re- he did have consensus to get rid of him. He just didn't get up one morning and call him in and say, are you loyal to me? And if, if you give him... He, he, he fired him. Clinton did not do that. And then when you remember when Nixon did it, right, that's what started the, the um, snowball um, rolling for him to be impeached. I mean, okay, so... Do you, do you really think that uh, that Trump asked him if he was loyal to him? Yeah, I believe it. You believe that? Yes. If you follow all his speeches over the last uh, couple of years, now he, you know there's he, a he, recording he, he somewhere, got, right? Well, if, if do you he, think there's a record? Do you well, think he recorded well, that if, conversation? Well, I, I wouldn't put it past him, but if he did, look what he started. Now he he gets on the air, he makes these declarations, and you know how I feel about I know declarations. How you feel about declarations. <laughs> I can't. Man. I can't. So he makes this declaration like, "You better not say anything because." You know, um, I, it might be taped. But what, remember, what? I told you, but Friday, remember I told you, I said Trump had the tape. He wasn't looking for Comey to have the yeah. tape. That Trump said, I got a tape. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, from what, from from the little we know of the real Mr. Trump, because now we're finding it out to know that he's but, absolutely crazy. Wait a minute, but, but Comey is a, is a wild card, right? He's a guy who, um, you know, by all accounts, looking at the uh, past election, uh, did not follow protocol, right? And so now the may, uh, the uh, the president who can, you know, has the right to fire the guy, says, look, 
I just don't think. And then when he was asked, he said, no, I didn't. I wasn't asking him if he could be loyal to me. I was saying, essentially, could he be loyal, you know, loyal to the Constitution, loyal to the country, loyal in terms of doing your job the way that you're supposed to do it. That he wasn't asking for personal loyalty. The, the president further says he wants to get to the bottom of it to find out whether or not there was, in fact, um, uh, uh, any any spying, any uh, any hacking, any collusion, any attempt to rig our our elections. Well, listen, man. I, you know, I don't think he's. I don't think he's. I'm just trying to balance the discussion. Yeah, well, that's not balancing. You're just talking some crap right now. I don't believe it. Well, let me just. In New York Times, right? They had an article. When did Joe call him a thug this morning? Well, listen. Can I be honest with you? Can I be honest with you? Anytime your peers, because Joe has been in politics all his life, congressman from Florida, he's been a talk show host and and involved in. He's a part of the political elite, right? Mm -hmm. He's a part of the political establishment. Now, it. When you call a leader of the free world or a leader of a city a thug, right, that means that they left you no, they left you no other um, opportunity to say anything different about them because they're acting like a thug. So when the political class or the political elite or the political, um, the, 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 uh, the, the media, media starts to define you that way, that means that's what you're showcasing. But the media the always defined him that way. No, they didn't. They said, they said listen. Even no, when he was well, running, they called his people the deplorables. Oh, well, they essentially called them thugs within the, you know, their. Well, guess what? If you saw some of those those rallies, those were some angry white people that just got sold a lot. No jobs are coming back. You know, their school systems are just as worse as any school systems in America. You know, they're going to still be looking for public assistance, and they're going to still be looking for help. So, um, Listen, have you seen as many leaks in? any presidential administration. I mean, the guy, they, you got people, man, I mean, they, they don't know how many people are leaking and from where the leaking is coming from, but I would bet you that Donald Trump can't uh, sniffle or blow his nose without somebody reporting that. Well, no president, listen, no president, every president, every president goes through that. That's one of the things Obama said. He said, listen, you know, when you're a president, you're in a bubble. You know, so it's about how you manage that, how you build a team around that. He goes out and makes all, he, look, his, his communication team goes out and says all of these things, and he gets on uh, uh, NBC and, and actually just says they're all lying because I was going to fire him anyway. I mean, who does that? I mean, come on. Let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you what it says here. You, yeah, I, think, I thought that Obama, was ridiculous. No, I mean, come on. So that, that means there's no order. We have a kangaroo court running... Um, um, running our White House now, running our, our country right now. It says here, I just got to get this because uh, I thought this was a good. The paradox is that Trump purports to be like Richard Nixon, a law and order president. His administration has ordered a harsh crackdown on drug offenders when we should be scaling up addiction treatment instead. Trump is focusing on fraud by non citizen voters, even as he impinges on an investigation into what could be a monument to electoral fraud by um, Vladimir P Putin. He favors tough law and order for a little guy, right? So I'm saying to myself, he has been contradicting everything that we've been attempting to do in this country on uh, um, changing our um, penal system. He's right now. He's saying, "Oh, forget what Obama did. Forget what the Republican and Democrats that got together to talk about. We need to change that. We're just going to lock him up, right?" But then what he's trying to do is throw out. A, an investigation and to him having an outside entity, outside country coming and steal our election. Then he fires Comey. Are you kidding me? Get out. Man, listen, man, I said it before. Everybody should have ran to the polls and voted against this guy. I mean, it's just, a, a, it just, it's just crazy. And I don't think it's going to get any better. So you don't think that now that, well, well who do you think that he's going to uh, appoint as the new uh, FBI director? I mean, that's going to be important. Right. I mean, what if he what if he goes and appoints a guy who everybody can agree is not loyal to Trump, right? And 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 would you know push forward with the continued investigation into this? Uh, I think the Democrats need to hold it up as best as they could until they get an independent um, prosecutor to investigate um, what's going on with the Russian um, tragedy. I mean, because they're going to find something. Comey was close to finding something. And I believe, you know, you can't define it as an obstruction of justice just yet, but I believe all of his actions, the president's actions, is leading to that. 
I think Comey and I think the CIA and I think that all of Trump's cohorts and when you go and you look at those LLCs, not just his tax returns, when you look at his LLCs, you can see he was getting tremendous amounts of money from the Russian oligarchy, what do you say to oligarchies the of the, um, uh, in Russia. But what do you say to people who say just because, you know, Comey's gone doesn't mean that those career uh, FBI uh, personnel uh, that, that they won't stop, that they have a job to do. Well, yeah, I, I believe so, but, I mean, it, so, start, but so, it starts at the top. Right now, there, there there's an erosion of confidence in, in the CIA and the FBI and the intelligence community because they got a strange person walking around the building not understanding how serious it is. But the one thing I do like, the checks and balances of our government, they're working. If, they're working. They're working. They're, they're, it's like there is the, they're, it's, it's um, what is it, um, it it's working. Mm -hmm. I just can't come up with another term, but it's working. So I'm glad to see that. But now I believe that the Republicans need to take that long journey up to Capitol Hill and say, cease and desist. Cease from Twittering. You just have a coherent um, 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 foreign policy. Let's look at what you're doing domestically. That's going to impact us in 2018 when we run. Because I believe there's going to be a well, shellacking. Well, there's going to be a shellacking. You talk about when Obama got shellacked. Oh, this is going to be a tsunami. Um, well, they're, already talk, they're already talking about it. midterm. So, I mean, at, at, look, and I think that Morning Joe, I think NBC, New York Times, Washington Post, I think I posted something. SNL. SNL. <laughs> yeah. I think I posted an <laughs> interview on my Facebook page, um, and they were having a discussion. Rimnick from The New Yorker was having a discussion with a panel, and they were basically a Stunned by what they're seeing, um, but when I turn um, on Fox, I don't hear any of this. Well, Fox is a TV <laughs> for crazy people, or if you just want to hear the crazy stuff, I mean, but Fox, I mean, listen, I mean, literally, I didn't I, hear any Comey stuff. Like this morning, I was going back and forth from Morning Joe and CNN to Fox. You don't hear any of the Comey stuff. You don't hear any of the anything. You know, they're pushing forward with what the president is doing. He's got a foreign trip coming up where he's on it now. Yeah, that's, yeah. Called, that's called wagging the dog. You know, you go out and you shake a lot of people's hands and say, see, I'm, wor I'm operating in the free world. I'm, I'm an internationalist. I can do it. Kind of, it's all bull. This guy's going to go across the world in the next seven days and make a fool out of himself. Are, are we smelling impeachment? We no. About this on I, I, yeah, but I, impeachment takes too long. I think re resignation. I think that somebody should do a test on uh, uh, testing his mental capacity. Because I think the guy's mentally <laughs> ill. I think he is challenged. Yeah, you're serious about oh, I'm that. serious, man. Hey, listen. All you have to do is go back and get all the clips. Look, any, you know, I see this locally, too. That This is funny, but I see this locally, too. We have some people in leadership that are absolutely cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You know, and, you know, we keep, you know, voting for them because, oh, we just like them. But when we really sit down and have a conversation with them, it will scare the hell out of you. <laughs> you be like, what the heck? You know, you're like, what? You've been elected that many times? You're running our cities? Come on. You sit down with these people long enough, you'll say, wow, this is a real scary human being. So did you hear the comment by um, uh, Miss USA? Kara? No, I didn't hear that. What did oh, she say? Well, you know, how they have to stand up and answer a couple questions, right? You know, and they usually say, I'm, you know, I'm hoping for world peace and those kinds of things. She was asked a question about uh, health care, and her response was that she believed that health care was a privilege, not a right. What? <laughs> I'm not going to even buy into that. Not gonna, she said, well, what, what? She, she said it was a privilege. She said health care, Miss USA, Karen McCullough says health care is a privilege instead of a right. Ignited social media. And what, what part of the world she's from? Oh, she's Miss USA. Really? Yeah. No, I didn't hear that. And black. Well, she's <laughs> black and foolish. <laughs> she might be black in, from Mars. I don't know, but that's ridiculous. She sounds ridiculous. Okay. Yeah, isn't she a scientist or something like that? I think she is. Yeah, she's yeah. just silly. She's just trying to be contrary. Some people, are, you know, you know, in this world, if you're provocative or if you're contrary, you know, then she'll be on Fox News and she'll have a contract, you know, not realizing she's doing detriment to, you know, poor families and middle class families and some rich families that health care is very critical to them. I mean, it's so, un it's, it's, look, all around the world, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the most progressive countries in the world have health care. For their their people, right? Mm -hmm. And and for us to be debating this right now is just a shame. It's just a shame, man. You know what I'm saying? It's just a shame. So I don't know what that's all about, buddy. I don't know what that's all about. I, I can't. I don't know the young lady, but I think she's crazy. You know. So, 
sounds like the aliens are coming, man. We hear it through our. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Uh, but this is community radio. Um, the. Uh, mm. Hold on for a second. Let me tell. Them. Okay. Yeah. Let them know. They probably try to fix something for you. Yeah. So we we've got some construction going on here. We'll see if we can uh, quiet it down for like the next 15 minutes until we're until we're done. Um, yeah. Oh, Kevin was successful in getting that done, so I appreciate that. And then tell him we're only going to be 15 more minutes. You know, 15 more minutes on the air, and then and then we'll be out of here. Um, listen, what I'm going to say while Kevin's out of the studio is we got to balance it. And I'm always concerned that when you listen to uh, one side, not the other side, that you may not get all of the information. Um the other thing I wanted to, to talk about, Kev, is... Yes, um, sir. And I saw a post. I'm going to see if I can find it, because it was a very interesting post. Did you have, have an opportunity to, uh, to see the debate between the, uh, the, the governors? No. The, uh, the Democratic gubernatorial... Oh, listen. Uh, when we're off air, I got to call uh, Jack Citarelli. Okay. Um, he wants to come on the show. Oh, great. Okay. I'd like to have you here, oh, okay. whatever day that is. I mean, oh. I'll try to find out. I know right. you're here on Mondays, and we right. do wrap up Fridays, right. but... Um, I'll, I'll be able to uh, to nail him down, uh, you know, after today's show. I like, the, I like the diversity of your show. I like yeah. it. I mean, listen. It's really grown, man. I got to tell you, it's really grown. Anybody that wants to sit in the hot seat, you know, we're, we're gentlemen. Welcome. Come and sit, you know. Sit. We'll have a conversation. Yeah, have a conversation. But, um, but there was a, a comment that Shavar Jeffries made, um, and I commented on it. Uh, I'm going to try to find <clears> it uh, regarding the, the gubernatorial debate. You had the the Democrats. You had the uh, other three guys when they were asked about charter schools. They were kind of well. No, they all said, you know what? We we believe that there needs to be uh, a moratorium. We need to take a look at things. We, either the funding, uh, which was what Jim Johnson said, and Lesniak and Wisniewski uh, believed that there needs to be a moratorium. And uh, and and Phil Murphy. Uh, uh, mentioned that, you know, as being on the NAACP, you know, on the board of NAACP, that they had put this proposal forward uh, for a complete moratorium. And he said, no, he, you know, he didn't agree with that, but he agreed with a pause or a timeout. And so then Shavar came on uh, and posted uh, in a thread that uh, that all of the candidates save Murphy uh, were jockeying for position around this whole charter school thing. And I said, I think that all of them were, that they didn't just kind of say, hey, listen, these parents are dealing with kids who are in a sinking boat and they're trying to find uh, you know, a safe way out and we shouldn't stop them. I think it should just be that clear. I'm against moratorium. Yeah, that's it. Period. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. And that's, that doesn't resolve anything. Yeah. I'm not going to take parents' choice away from them. You know, but I, but I do believe we been. need to, I, and you know, I've been consistently saying this, we need to re-engineer our public schools and that should be a priority. All of our schools should be at, operating at the highest standards, a higher standard, I should say. And you know what, there's no negotiating that. You know, there's no, you know, I, if you believe in a, mor a moratorium, what you're saying to me is that you're not willing to roll up your sleeves, you're just placating to special interest. Because special interest is what's driving that. And it is a very complex issue, but it's a, a complex issue that can be resolved by just telling the truth that our schools are failing, and charter schools did give us an opportunity to break that cycle of failure, but they're not the end or be all either, but we need to sit down and roll up our sleeves to come up with a strategic, a strategic plan that, um, you know, effectively prepares our children for the 21st century. Right. Now, that's what you got to do. All of this mumble jumble, all of this, you know, how you feel. I really don't care how you feel. At the end of the day, we have to create a, a, a system, an ecosystem, where our kids can thrive, right, where our kids can learn, and where our kids are encouraged um, um, to learn, and that we build a community based on uh, um, values that help them to help us to grow out our local economy and grow out our cities. At the end of the day, who really cares? You know, elections really drive me crazy. Sometimes, you know, it's about yes and no. I don't believe in moratoriums because that's not the answer. Right. Right? And a lot of these people that are running for office, and I've seen this over and over again, they just can't answer the question. They can't. Right? Because at the end of the day, they're getting paid by special interests. And when you're getting paid by special interests or you're getting supported by special interests, they hold you hostage. But a real independent person who says, 
I don't believe in moratoriums. I don't believe in this, but I believe if we do this, we can change all of that, right? You don't have that. You know, people, they be in the audience, you know, everybody's just a hot mess. But it's an interesting thread that you guys might want to check out. So I'm going to read his comment and then yeah, we'll move sure. on to the next section. He says, with all the issues facing the state, $60 billion in pension liability, second lowest bond rating in the country, crumbling transportation infrastructure, high property and income tax rates, I find it shit. He actually said he finds it shameful that every Democrat candidate for governor, say Phil Murphy, a jockeying to deny high quality school options to low income kids. I think he's right. I think he's right about that. I don't, I don't, I don't, he sounds like I, I, I sound when I talk about Newark, when you make people make huge declarations. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you know, when you go in back rooms and take money, or then when you. Well, no, but I mean, I guess the, the, the only question that I, I had and the other people had was I think that Murphy, too, if you listen to his answer. So he pulled, Oh, you were just saying he he's, he's, he's saying said, that all of them except Murphy were yeah. doing this, and I'm saying if you listen to Murphy's answer, um, I'd like him to be as clear as you are. I am not for moratorium. Well, but one of the things, one of the things, uh, in full disclosure, you know, I support Phil Murphy. But one of the things that you know he did say it is complex. It is complex. It is complex, right? It's complex for him because he hasn't spent that much time in the space like you and I have. Right. It's very simple for me. Because I've been, I've looked under the lid. I've looked at the advocacy organizations. I've looked at where the money comes from. I've helped to develop strategies for community engagement and parent engagement. I understand what vouchers could have been uh, could have been helpful for your traditional um, Catholic schools, right? I do understand that vouchers might not be the right tool at the right time to really address those education needs of parents. But I do know one thing that we should not get up in another 20 years and have a failing school in the city of Newark. I sent you something. I sent you something that you should post. I want to have this discussion. Restoring the promise of public education, right? Mm -hmm. I sent that to you. Yep. And I want you to post that. And that's a long read. But if you're going to listen to this show, we're going to empower you with the information. Right. So when people call in and they're trying to do commercials, we can say, did you read the article? Because we read it. Right. And we, share, we showed it with our public. We shared it with our public. Restoring the promise of public education. This is a phenomenal oh, man, document. Read, yeah, I read it. Right? Phenomenal. It was phenomenal. It was, I, and, and the work that this still And the guy started it. doing it back in the 60s. Yeah. When, when the, all of our schools in America basically were seg segregated. Right? Yeah. I mean, but, come on. you got to read that. But in that, and I'm going to post it, but in the article, the things that stood out to me, um, the real thing that stood out to me, was the engagement of the community in all of this, man, that they stayed engaged and they valued education. And we have to be at the point where we're valuing education. And you know what? Did you, uh, this was the, um, I don't know if you sent this to me, Tap Into Newark, the article headline, North Star Academy ranked top high school in Newark and 24th in New Jersey. That's incredible. Yeah. But, I got, but I, got a big, I got a bigger issue, though. That should not be the only school. And that's why creating this ecosystem and having a real serious conversation is so important. Well, it says in, I total, hear, it says, hear, it says hear, in yeah. total five schools were ranked in the top 85 in the state. This is in Newark. In addition to North Star and Science Park High School, um, and it had Technology High, you had University High School uh, as well. So, I mean, some of the schools in Newark are, you know, but we're, but we're talking magnet schools, right? Now, is, is technology high a magnet? Yeah, I would imagine. I think so, yeah. Right. I want all our schools to be that way. And guess what? I mean, the, the, the standards are so low. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I should be congratulating any of them. The stand, I mean, I know that sounds horrible, and I'm, I'm very happy that those kids are doing so well because of obviously they're in a culture of success, and they have a strong education community and great staff members and a great mission. But on the same side, they're suspending... African American boys at a level that's unquestionable, um, unconscionable. Right. So, you know, I like to look at everything now. I'm learning now. You know what? I want to look at everything. I want to see where you what what the metrics are on all of the in all of these areas here. Because that guy that was suspended, that young man that was suspended for 45 days, mm -hmm. right? He he was hungry. He went to the store and took something to eat. Yeah. But he goes to that school. Right. And he's one of their top students. I don't know if he's going to be a top student any longer. And, and so. So please, you know what? I don't bother. I'm just, I'm just not bonding anymore. You know, I, I love it. I see, but I want to look a little closer now. I'm of the opinion now that we have to look at everything, after, especially after this last school board election. 
I mean, you you know, after this last school board election, I mean, that has frightened me. I think that is that should be an issue. Everybody should continue to keep talking about this. That's why restoring the promise of public education, this piece was so important. You got to read it. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna post this. Yeah, so you gotta that, read uh, it so that folks can see it. I, yeah. I found it a compelling. And movie. I think that um, Rashawn should talk about it tomorrow since he's. Oh, you know, did, 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 did yeah, we I think I sent it to him. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll make sure that he, uh, you know, that he reads it and that we can have a an in depth conversation. I mean, it was about brilliant, it. brilliant. No, I thought that uh, you know, I mean, do you want to tease it? Yeah, we should. Uh, yeah, we should definitely. Um, you know, uh, the whole focus, the whole our hope this year is to have real dialogue um, about education um, and take a small area and try to create the right ecosystem and the right language and the right science that will at least, uh, where well, you can have an effective education about moving forward. About moving forward because we got, in Newark it's still, you know, education failure, not education success. You know, and after this last school board election, I'm just still disturbed by it. Well, Listen, because, because, well, Deborah Terrell, Deborah Terrell. Yeah, but, but as long as you're doing we, politics over everything, Nor then, then how do you get to it? Deborah Terrell, blue ribbon um, winner twice. So here's what I like, and, and I, you know, maybe you can reach out to uh, Dr. Terrell. I'd love to have her be a part of the panel on the show having a discussion hey, about education. Right. You know what? Yep. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So bring her, and, and because I think it would do a couple things. I think that it would show, it would showcase her, and it would show what the what Norkers didn't vote for, right? Um, and I think that uh, I think that it would be valuable. I think the information that she could pour out on the residents of Nork, and not just residents of Nork, but anybody else who's listening about how important education is and what we need to do in order to move forward, uh, would be valuable. Look. Tell us what you know on Mondays. We just had two dynamic African-American men that are running strong institutions, both from Newark. I'm going to call her. Right? We just had two dynamic African-American men sitting in this room talking about recreation and talking about community policing and talking about the great work their mayor is doing in Irvington, Mayor Voss is doing in Irvington, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you've had this kind, you had Ted Green on your show talking about his vision for the city of, I mean, for the um, of, of city of East Orange. You had Mayor... Um, what's Orange Mayor Warren? Uh, right. Um, you have Mayor Warren from Orange. Even in his trying times now, he still came on the show and talked about his vision for his city. Correct. correct. I correct. think that took courage, by the way. Uh, yeah. And I was on the show. I would have asked him a, diff a, a number of other questions, but I know him really well. He's a good guy, and I know he's going to, you know, at least organize his next steps for for the future for the city of Orange because it's an important an important um, city. So you know. We have the ability to bring anybody we want to bring on this show. I think jobs, 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 and education, and education, and education. And there was an, um, I don't know if you, I sent you something about um, the new emerging leadership. They have a lot of young African Americans now um, that are involved in trying to get elected. Right, the millennials. I think we yes, should do I something did. on the millennials. I think you should, sh you should share that. Millennials are in a real trick bag because they're loyal to some of us. Right, and they don't have the organization and or the money to really push their voice into the marketplace and define themselves as leaders. But I do believe with the use of um, social media, they can make a big difference. You know, I talk to some millennials sometimes, and I don't know what the hell they're talking about, mm. but I think they're concerned about something. Yeah, but they gotta they gotta get beyond the social. Uh, social media is a piece of it, um, but then they have to get uh, folks to do more. I mean, we talked about this during the last board election, right? We had uh, you know a millennial in uh, in Charles Love Run, and you had a lot of people who were active on social media, but they thought that that's where their activism began and ended. Yeah, hitting like, hitting share, the different emojis that are available there. Uh, and they so you're talking about that's lazy, the lazy democracy. Yeah. I mean, so I'm saying that's a level of engagement for sure. It's a way to uh, disseminate information. But when you get, you know, when, you, when you're in an election or doing anything, at some point you have to get up off of your computer, off of your phone, your mobile device, and you have to get out in the community. You have to actually do something. And I, I said to you guys during that campaign, if all the people who had like and share on his post, if they had simply gone and gotten 15 people each, yeah. To come out and vote, I think I think a lot. I think a lot of the people in the city of Newark were they're just bone tired. I mean, we got to get them activated again. I think we're gonna have a next 18, 12 months to have real serious dialogue. Let's see if uh, if the people in Newark are ready to to move to the next level. I mean, this, this next election that's coming up, you know, will be um, 
indicator if we're ready to move forward. I agree. So listen, man, we're running out of time. This um, is a great show. Yeah, I'm just going to let it go to com go go to the 12 o'clock hour. Okay. Yeah, this is Eric. Kevin. We're out. May I be the first to say Flash Radio. It's 94.3. Radio. Dance Hall. Soka. Hip Hop and R&B. African. Disco. Oldie.